I thought I was the one who didn't eat properly. Can we try again? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good evening to all my brothers and sisters. My name is Maz Yunus and I will be your MC for tonight. Tonight's talk is the final episode of the series, The Greatest Woman, brought to you by Revivals in collaboration with the Alumni Relations Divisions. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to get a quick uh, raise of hands. How many of you are here uh, attending this series for the first time? Just a quick raise of hands. Okay. We have got few new faces. Uh, mashallah, most of you have attended before as well. So Revival's got uh, really a loyal audience here. Mashallah. Uh, through the past few months, we have delved into what is known about the lives of Asya alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam, and Fatima radiallahu anha the legacies they have left behind as the greatest woman uh, to have ever lived. If you, if you didn't make it to the previous, previous events, do check them out on our YouTube channel because the values you will learn from these stories of these noble women um, as the greatest woman to have ever lived among the people of paradise are undoubtedly invaluable. And you may think that you already know about them, but there is always something, there is always something beneficial to take away from these sessions. So tonight, we culminate the series on the four great women mentioned in the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the story of Khadija radiallahu anha, the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Known as the mother of believers, she is considered to have been the first person to believe in the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At this point, some of you may be uh, wondering what meaning lies behind the design of the events poster, right? So what's the meaning behind the necklace? Any guesses? Well, today, uh, don't forget to take notes as we delve into a deeply emotional story of the, uh, of the life of Khadija radiallahu anha and unveil the story behind the necklace, hopefully, inshallah. Without further ado, introducing our speaker for tonight, we're grateful to have with us um, Sheikh Dr. Ibrahim Nuhu Tahir, founder of Annada Educational Foundation. Annada works to alleviate difficulties and fulfill the needs of poor Muslims in Nigeria and elevate them with, with education. Sheikh was born and raised in Nigeria. He started Islamic education from a young age in the most classical way with his father, Dr. Nuhu Tahir. May Allah preserve him and other uh, local scholars. He completed his bachelor's in Sharia and Islamic studies followed by postgraduate diploma in Islamic, uh, Islamic law and Islamic political science from the Islamic University in Medina. And then he completed his master and, and, and PhD right here in IIUM in Sharia and civil laws and is now an associate professor uh, in, the, in the Department of Economics and Management Sciences. Sheikh Ibrahim allows a lot of his free time to engage with youth and uh, spread the deen, the knowledge, and the terbiyah of the Muslim youth. He conducts classes in fiqh, tafsir, akhlaq, and other essentials. We'll learn about those classes later on as we move through the event. <clears throat> Throughout today's talk, uh, if you happen to have any burning questions, such as whether or not you can have a cat as, as your companion, or if you're curious on how to find the right spouse, or maybe you have found one but she doesn't know, then, then please remain calm and post them on pigeonhole. So you can scan the QR code from the screen or type in the URL, pigeonhole.at slash LKRA2. Uh, so at the end of the talk, Sheikh will be uh, will address these questions with the most votes, inshallah. There are always people, you see, there are always people who, who find ways to upvote their own questions, right? So I've seen like uh, questions uh, voted more than 172 times, but um, just, uh, you know, don't waste your energy because at the end of the day, we are going to choose the questions uh, which has the, the most number of the uh, most number of votes, uh, but also relevant to the topic. So, but if you don't have any uh, any of the questions that I mentioned before, then congrats and mabrook. But, but on a serious note, if you don't have any questions, then you can just go through the questions and vote them, vote for them, okay? So that's uh, regarding um, pigeonhole question. Now, this session will be split into two parts, part one and part two. We'll have a break, okay? But the break is for the sheikh. Not for you guys. We'll conduct a quiz session on Kahoot. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Kahoot, right? Anyone here not familiar with Kahoot? Right, everyone's familiar, mashallah. So 
The questions will be based on the first half of the session. So make sure you pay full attention and take notes, right? And winners get goodies. OK, speaking of goodies, we have got many surprises for you all today. OK, we have got new merch. Any guesses? Any guesses of new merch? Yeah, how about now? Right, so introducing Revivers Caps, you asked for it and we have delivered. You see, uh, uh, so thank you for all the votes on social media. So thank you for voting for the best design. Now, usually caps don't look uh, great on me, but I think it's time for that to change. So if you happen to like it, you can buy one for me as well. And um, hats off to Revivers team for bringing us with uh, new merch and goodies. We have more surprises coming up, so hold fast and pay attention. Okay, lastly, before we begin, I would like to invite, uh, I, sorry, I'd like to inform you to be careful of your belongings. We have a large number in the crowd today, mashallah, and as you can see, the number is increasing as well. So, and things tend to get misplaced in such events. Someone or the other is always like forgetting his umbrella, a water bottle, or uh, a pet hamster. You know, it happened. Or, or maybe a car behind the seat. So, so hold on to your pre precious items, or you can give it to me. Uh, with that being said, I would like to welcome Sheikh Ibrahim Nuhu on the stage. So with that being said, I would like to welcome Sheikh Ibrahim Nuhu to the stage. Sheikh, the stage is yours. Uh, please welcome. Sheikh, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudillalah wa man yudhul falahadiyalah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويكفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يضي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. First of all, I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to reward the organizers of this event. Allah سبحانه وتعالى put baraka in the society and the activities. It is an honor to be invited to be speaking before you about this noble and important topic. Uh, especially at this uh, type of time that we are living in where the Muslim Ummah are in need of the reminders about our predecessors, how they used to live because their success is confirmed to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises us and asks us to ask him to guide us, a guidance which is similar to theirs. 
every day when you read in your prayer, you recite Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alehim, Ghail al Magdubi Alehim, Walla Every day you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least 10 to 17 times. You are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the Sirat al Mustaqim. And you specify what you meant by the Sirat al Mustaqim. You say, Allah, guide me to the Sirat of those people who preceded me. You're talking about the predecessors. And these ones are those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah 2 and Nisa. When he says, مِنَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَئِكَ رَفِيقًا So that shows the importance of history because And that shows the importance of history <clears throat> As the scholars mentioned that Surah Al-Fatiha is called Ummul Quran Ummul Kitab, because one of the themes of the surah is history. You have the Tawheed, and you have the Ibadah, and you have the history. So we need to read about those ones for us to understand how did they used to live, and what are the causes of the success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, because as I said, we are sure about their success. We are sure about their success. So Muslims need to read the history, so that he will know the life of those ones and be able to imitate them in in the present present time. Without reading the history, you will not know how did they did they live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the best examples in the lives of the prophets and those who followed them. It says, In that which has been mentioned to you in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and those who preceded Yusuf alayhi salam from amongst the messengers and the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are a lot of beautiful and excellent lessons for whoever wants to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here comes the importance of a lecture like this. And I believe you have been receiving a lot from the scholars who have been standing on this uh, platform speaking about those most excellent uh, personalities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for. For the human being. In uh, Surah Al Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates whomsoever He wishes and He chooses from those whom He created whomsoever He wishes. Ibn Al Qayyim in his book, Zadu Al Ma'ad, he had a very excellent commentary on this ayah. He said, In all of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're told about them. There are some which we call the chosen ones. Allah SWT has chosen them. Amongst the angels, you have the chosen one. They're all the best in comparison to the humankind because they don't have the concept of sin. It's not to say that they don't have a choice, as most of us believe in. No, they do have. But Allah SWT created them in a way an angel doesn't say to Allah Subhanahu Taala, no. That's the most important lesson we learn from the angels, whenever they are mentioned, dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with no comments. Because the only one that you have to take what he says without having a comment, without having a second thought, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is conveying the message on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So among the angels, you have those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored over the rest. And among the human beings also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen some whom he called them the best, and these are the, the prophets. And amongst the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Rusul. You know, the Rusul, they are better than the prophet. And they themselves also are not equal, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Tilka Rusul, Faddalna ba'dahu ala ba'd. And that's why it is wrong to say that you don't make a comparison between a prophet and another prophet, and you don't make a preference. No, there are darajat between these prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make them equal. He said, فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ We favor some of them over the others. He says, مِنْهُمْ مَنْ كَلَّمَ اللَّهِ Some of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken to them. Like who? Musa alayhi salam, right? And by the way, uh, how many people 
and spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before death. I thought I'm asking a question. You know. Two, who are they? Wallah, you should have another mic or so. Uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did Allah speak to him? Uh, in where? In the Isra or the Miraj. Okay. In particular, Isra or the Miraj. Had the Miraj. So who else Allah SWT spoke to? Musa alayhi wa Apart from Musa? There are, there are one, one person who said. Adam alayhi salam. Sakallahu khairan. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith of Abu Dhar, when he asked him about Adam alayhi salam, uh, was he a prophet or a messenger? The Prophet sallallahu said, Nabiyun mukallam. He was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some of them he favored them because to speak to Allah, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to you, this is really, really a favor. That took Musa to that position of being the third amongst the human beings. If you look at the order of the Ulul Al-Azim Mina, Mina Rusul. So that's why the scholars said, amongst the Rusul also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen those five messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And amongst those five also Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been chosen to be the best of the, of the best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَحَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا Mahmuda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take some part of the night, you know, and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray the night prayers in some part of the night as an additional task for you. That's why many scholars said, قِيَامُ اللَّيْلِ فِي حَقِّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ وَاجِبْ I mean, the Qiyamul Layl is wajib for the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And what was the reward that Allah SWT is going to give him? He said, عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا Mahmuda, Because Allah wants to resurrect you on the Day of Judgment at the best and the most noblest position. And this is the place where every Prophet of Allah SWT is aiming for. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إِنَّهَا دَرَجَةُ لَا تَنْبَغِي إِلَّا لِعَبْدٍ مِنْ إِبَادِ اللَّهِ is a position which is not going to be given except to one person. And he said, I wish, inshallah, Allah SWT will make me that, that person. That's why he says, when you hear the Mu'addin, you should say exactly what the Mu'addin is saying, except in Hayy al salah Hayy al falah The Prophet Sallallahu said, you should change it with La hawla la quwata illa billah. When you say it after that, what must you do? You do the salah on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salat al Ibrahimiyyah, that's the best. And then after that, then you make that dua, Allahumma rabba hadi da'wah, until the end of the dua. He says, if you do this, because you are asking Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him al wasila, he said, Tahillu laka shafa'ati. My shafa'a is going to be halal, halal for you. You get it? So, what I'm trying to say is, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, creation belongs to him, and the choice also belongs to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanallah, whenever you see somebody who happened to be chosen by Allah, if you check the life of that person, you will see that person being an extraordinary person. He's not a normal person. He has to qualify that cho cho I mean, choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa, and all of those prophets of Allah that we got that story in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ That's the main essence and the reason why history is being given to, to us. So that we can benefit from that history. We learn about the future, uh, the past. We learned about the, the predecessors. How did they used to live their life and what made them succeed in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah says, unfortunately, the vast majority of the people are not taking this message including our time. We need history to enjoy. We need stories to enjoy and laugh. But Allah SWT is not mentioning story for others. That's why if you look at the stories in the Quran, they're very precise and straight to the point. Sometimes the whole story of a prophet could be combined in few lines. Yeah, straight to the point. The main reason why Allah SWT is bringing this story is this. Allah SWT wants you to focus on that and then make a move to another, another prophet. And there is a benefit in reading history. The scholar said, Man wa'at tarikha fi, fi sadrihi adhafa a'amaran ila umurihi. If you manage to read history, 
and understand it properly and put it into practice and action, you're going to add on top of your age other ages because you will be using the short cut way, right? You already studied the, the causes of the success for these people. You know why did it succeed? And you follow the same cause. You also end up succeeding. And you know the failure of those ones and how did they fail and why did they fail? You study that, you avoid all of those causes of failure. You will also succeed without failing in the way they, they, they fail. So today, inshallah, we'll be dealing with one of those uh, chosen ones. Uh, and uh, she's the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first uh, person the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, met as his spouse. And this is Khadija radiallahu anha, which I know uh, uh, is a kind of a reminder, I call it. It was just refreshing our mind because Khadija is not uh, uh, somebody who is anonymous. I guess most of the things I'm going to be saying, we already uh, know them. So it's just, uh, I call it mudhakara bi'ithin Allah azza wa jalla to review that which we have in, in the mind. Who is this uh, person? Khadija radiallahu anha. Her name is Khadija tu bintu Khwailid. al Sadiya Ummu Al-Qasim. And uh, some of the historians said her nickname, the kunya is Ummu Hashim. And uh, she's from the Quraysh. And uh, she is also related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the lineage of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from three dimensions. From the side of her mother, she is connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through his grandfather, Qusay. And from, this, uh, from the side of her father, through Qusay. Uh, from the side of the mother, through the Lu'ai. And from the side of her grandmother, the mother's mother, she is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Abdul Manaf bin Ibn Qusay. So this is how she is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of uh, lineage. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the time which Khadija radiallahu anha lived is not the time of narrations. Yeah, it's not a time of narration. That's why most of the people who talk about Khadija, the vast majority of the talk, you know, is about other matters, not Khadija herself. Yeah, because she lived at a time, you know, uh, that kind of attitude of narrating, you know, what is going on was not there in that in that time. So we have to depend on the books of the history. You know, some of these things might not be authentic. As uh, Al-Dhahabi said, or Iraqi in his Alfiya, he says, Well, yeah, let me tell you, and the Sierra, Tejma, my Saha, my Kad Nukira, Al Kosdu, Vikuruma at Al Sier, Behiwa in Isnaduhu, La Yurtava. He says, As a student of knowledge, you should know that history gathers everything. You know, that's why in the past, the scholars, when they narrate uh, history, they narrate it with Senate because they believe they are dealing with students who have the capacity and ability and the tools to differentiate between right and wrong. They will not tell you this is authentic, this is not authentic. That's why we have to be very careful when you go to Tariq Al-Tabari, Al-Bidaya wa Nihali Ibn Kathir, you know, and some other books of the history, you know, sometimes we argue if somebody is to go against it, we will say, no, Ibn Kathir mentioned this and that. It has to be correct. No, Ibn Kathir himself also did not say that whatever I mentioned in my book is, is correct. What they do is exactly what this poet was saying. He said, you should know that the historians, the main purpose of that compilation is to gather whatever was set to take place in the, in the past, regardless of its nature. You know, he says, Al-Qasdu dhikru ma'ata ahlu siyar bihi wa in isnaduhu la yu'tabar. So sometimes we have to go through this. We just keep quiet. We narrate what is set to be. You know, the nature of a person, we just keep quiet because if you are going to treat the sun, uh, I'm sorry, the history in the way you are uh, dealing with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are going to reject, you know, uh, two thirds, if not the vast majority of the, of the history. That's why the scholar said, you don't treat history like a hadith, except when the history contains a hukum shari. When there is hukum shari, and uh, this is supposed to be taken from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this case, then you have to treat this history like a hadith. Yeah, all the, the, the shirut and the conditions of Isnad, you have to critically analyze the, the chain. Or if the history contains criticism against somebody. And that's why when it comes to the, the clash that happens between Maui and Ali radiallahu anhu, we really have to be very careful because if you take them anyhow, you're going to end up 
touching the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is a red line which should be crossed by any Muslims. That's why you have to go to the scholars who will combine the narrations and tell you which one is correct and which one is which one is uh, uh, wrong. So this is the name of Khadija, Khadija bin Khuwailid, and this is how she was related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, she used to be a business uh, person. Uh, it might be, uh, uh, bec I mean, uh, uh, because of what she inherited from her previous uh, spouses. Because the scholars mentioned that she used to be married, like any other uh, person, she used to be married before she met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At first she married a person called Zurara ibn Nabash, Abu, Abu Hala. And she got two children with him, uh, Hind and Hala. And uh, subhanAllah, they mentioned that these are boys, but at the time they used those two names also to address, to address boys, Hind and Hala, Ibn Abi Hala. So he lived with her a very short period of time and then he passed away. And then she married after him, another person called, uh, called Atiq ibn Abid. Yeah, she married Atiq ibn Abid and she got a daughter uh, with him uh, whose name was, was Hind. And after that, then uh, that person also died. And they mentioned that uh, these two entities, they left a lot of money uh, with her. So she used to call, she used to be called At-Tahira al Afifa. She used to be called At-Tahira al Afifa. Wallahu alam, what I found in, the, in the, the history books is that because she used to be a very decent woman. She wears very decent clothes and she don't uh, mix with the, the brothers. And that uh, might be the reason why in her businesses, she doesn't do the business directly. Very good business person, but she does not do it directly. She passed it to somebody who will invest the money and come and share the profit with her. And this is what we call mudaraba. And by the way, this uh, concept of mudaraba exists since before the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is just an additional benefit. I will uh, benefit the crowd in case you are not aware of it. In Islam, you will never, most likely, you know, I never cross any place in the books of fiqh where the list of businesses that a person is allowed to be conducting is mentioned. We don't have such a thing. Because almost all the businesses you find them being mentioned by the scholars of fiqh in the books of fiqh, they have been practiced by the Arabs before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. So what Islam does is to provide standards and conditions and principles to regulate those businesses. Wherever mistakes and riba exist, Islam will eliminate it. We'll tell you don't do this because it has this element of gharar. Don't do this because it has the element of riba. Don't do this because it is oppression. So having this in mind will lead you to understand that this have been kept based on the general principle that says al-asl fil ashya'i al ibaha Everything that you found on earth is halal or haram. Halal or haram. Halal. Ikhtalaf al-ulama, right? Yeah, some, some said is halal and some said is haram and some kept quiet right how will i learn? these are the people who we call al mutawaqifa you know there are sometimes you find some some scholars they don't want to voice out their opinion and then they will say we are mutawaqifu but the correct opinion is what some of you have mentioned that everything you found on earth is been made halal for you including the businesses they say asul fil yeah, the general principle when it comes to uh, transaction is that everything is permissible except why you find Sharia stating, stating otherwise. You get it? So having this in mind, that means I have the permission by the Sharia to come up with my own mode of business. I'm going to make a conclusion which I think everyone is affected here. And therefore you have to be very careful because you can tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you cannot tell Allah SWT, this is what I found in the community. Everything that Allah SWT wants you to do, He has made it very clear. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Al-Halal Ubayyin, Wal-Haram Ubayyin, Wa Baynahuma Umurun, Mushtabihat. Halal is clear, and Haram is clear, and between Haram and Halal, you have the doubtful matters. These doubtful matters are, all, are only doubtful to who? To some of us, not to everyone.
That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, not everyone knows the correct ruling concerning the doubtful matters. So what is my job as a Muslim? To do the halal and to stay away from the haram. If something is doubtful to me, what is my job? Is to call a scholar or to go and meet a scholar for explanation. If you couldn't find somebody to tell you what Allah Subhanahu wants you to do concerning that thing, what must you do? You stay away from, from it. Very simple principle given to us by the Sharia, but unfortunately nowadays, we don't want to, to take it. So what I'm trying to say is, nowadays you find businesses in the name of Islam, we keep the same title which is known to be the title accepted by the scholars, but unfortunately when it comes to the content, you find something, something else, right? That's why even the mudaraba that you see, which used to happen before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but some people are telling us nowadays this is established based on ijtihad. What is the difference between ijtihad and the text? Because if you agree that it is based on the text, that means ijtihad has no place here. You have to accept it in the way it was. To get idea, do we need to modify any ijtihad? No. What we're supposed to do is to create our own businesses and wait with the mizan of the, of the Sharia. If it goes with it, then we take it. If it doesn't, a Muslim has to stay away from, from, uh, from it. With no darura, because to find a darura case in this situation is very, is very difficult. So back to Khadija. Khadija used to do this a business to invest her wealth, but he, she used to send uh, people to go and do the business and she shared the money with them including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he was assigned as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to uh, go with her tijara and subhanallah they mentioned that uh, this is one of the reasons why she agreed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to become a husband. And here I have an advice for all of us. You see, according to what history is telling us or at least some part of the history, Khadija, Khadija has been monitoring the Prophet Sallallahu She benefited a lot from his honesty and also the Prophet generated by him is greater than any other Prophet. And she monitored him to see his values and manners. And that was the reason why she proposed, according to some of the historian, to marry the Prophet Sallallahu So she made that choice to have somebody in her, in her company. Did she succeed in that choice? Did she succeed in that choice? Yes. Marital relationship, I mean, marital life is a key, you know, in human, human's life. And therefore, a person should think wisely. And you, Allah, you need a partner. You need somebody who will cooperate with you. You need somebody who focus on your attitude and your behaviors rather than your physical appearance. You need somebody who will comfort you. All of these, you find them in the life of Khadija, which will, will shed light on some of them, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. But as a size benefit, most of you here, I know you are not, you are not married, and you're going to do it in the, in the future. Yeah, you have to think wisely. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has given us a very simple principle, although it goes against the vast majority of our choices. What is the vast majority of our choices? What do we go for? Beauty or religion, or um, what is the other one? Wealth, or position. Which one most of us are focusing on? Religion, right. <laughs> Which religion are you talking about? I got somebody who told me, is it halal for him to modify the istikhara? I said, how? Because he wants to marry that person, but he's afraid if he do the istikhara, Allah might choose somebody else, not this one. <laughs> Yo Allah. So he told me, is it, is it okay for, to modify it? I said, how would you do it? He said, I will say, Ya Allah, I know you are the most powerful and you are capable of doing everything. Ya Allah, although this woman might not be good, Ya Allah, change her to be good so that... <laughs> <laughs> Very smart, right? But subhanAllah, in the wrong way, why do we need istikhara? Why do we need istikhara? I heard somebody When you are com confused, uh, that's... Thank you very much. She is answering one of the questions that I did not ask yet. 
It's just when do we need istikhara? But now I'm saying why why do we need istikhara? Yeah, to ask of course to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But why do we need it? Istikhara, I guess we're asking Allah, right? Assalamu alaikum. When we do istikhara, we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what? To choose for us, right? Yeah, to choose for us and to guide us and to put our hand on the best place, right? Uh, or that it is business or marriage or whatever you are doing, the Prophet ﷺ said anything that is important in your life, you should go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to choose for you the best. Why do I need to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Did you ever see a person who engaged in a business and fail and regret? Assalamu alaikum. A lot, especially nowadays, right? Yeah. Did you ever see a couple who married and at the end of the day they, they cry? The wife is crying and the husband is crying? A lot, right? Yeah. That's the reason why we need the istikhara. Because if you check a person, you might see all positive, you know, things. And this is human capacity. But Allah SWT knows the future, the present and the future. What exactly this person will be, you know? And by Allah, wallahi, we need istikhara more than the time of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Because those ones, they focus on values and manners. Nowadays, the physical appearance is more. You get an idea. We focus on shallow things, you know. These are the things that will determine what exactly, uh, I mean, our choice is going to be in, in the future. And that's why we regret a lot. So we go for istikhara because Allah knows the future. He knows that this person might not remain in the way he is. You know, nowadays we hear a lot of false, you know, promises, you know, because I want to get that thing. You want to get it. That's why we say things which are not part of us. Yeah, that's why in, in, in marriage, that attitude that we're having, which is said, I mean, to propose to marry a sister and you take a longer time before the marriage. I'm telling you, my dear brothers and sisters, you should avoid it. It's very wrong. The more you come closer to your khatiba, the less respect you're going to have in in the future yeah trust me marriages that are done in a very short period of time they are more likely to succeed than those which are done after spending long periods of time and that's why sometimes when they uh, they married also they don't enjoy marriage in the way they used to enjoy life before the marriage that's why in islam you don't find where the prophet Sallallahu is asking you to sit for talking and conversation but they have justification, those people who are doing it, because they said, I need to know who she is. And I, uh, she said, I need to know who he is. I need to know the way he thinks. Question, is it possible for her to know who this person is? And is it possible for him to know who she is by listening to her or listening to him? No. No, because if I want something, usually we act in the way that person will be pleased with us. One of our colleagues was uh, talking about his friend. This friend of his never been seen carrying a baby. He is known to them that this person doesn't carry babies. The moment he met the khatiba, he was the one who was asking her to bring the baby. They were surprised and laughing at him. They said, yesterday you never carry a baby in your life. Why when you see how you carry the baby now? Yeah, this is who we are. So what happened is, I will keep giving false promises and she will keep giving uh, uh, false promises. When they marry, they live together, they cannot hide their true identity for, for long. Then he will start acting in the way he is and she, in the way she is, and then clashes will start taking place in, in the marriage. So focusing on the values, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, usually people marry based on one of the four things. Either the deen or, what is the other one? Wealth or position or, what is the other one? Beauty. Yeah, most of us goes to the, the last one. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us advice. He says, Alayka bidat al-deen, teribat yadak. He said, take the one who has the deen, you will be successful in this, in this life. So please, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, as I said, I know most of you did not marry yet, Think wisely before you make a choice. 
yeah, you need a partner. You need somebody who knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only religious practices can make you happy in, in your marriage. And this is the difference between us and, and the pre previous uh, nations. Umar radiallahu anhu used to say that <clears throat> sometimes I don't even have interest in approaching my wife, but I create that interest out of the hope that Allah SWT might bring somebody who will, I will never stop, out of the hope that Allah SWT might bring somebody who will be praising him in, in the house. So back to the marriage of uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, many of the historians said that she was the one who proposed to marry the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Question, is it okay for a woman to ask for the hand of a man? No, wait, 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 wait. wait. The norm in the in the in our communities is the the boy looking for her hand, right? But this time around, the woman is asking for him uh, for his son. I mean, to marry. Is it okay? Don't you take it as disrespect or anyway? I'm just asking question. Is it okay? Okay to do it. Do you have any evidence for that? Oh, mashallah. So I'm talking in, in the presence of Fokaha, right? So I have to be very careful. What is the evidence then? Oh, culture says it's not allowed. Yeah. So now. So we have in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it happened, right? Yeah. Can I have one example from the people in front? No, that's Sharu Man Qablana. That's the Sharia of those people who came before us. I want the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at him. He went back to the... You couldn't find any in the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yusuf. Uh, that one, the one that says al wahiba to nafsaha li nabi sallallahu alayhi wa right? Okay, just say al wahiba The one who gave the prophet, uh, she, she told the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, I am presenting myself as a gift for you. And he is the only one who can marry like this. The rest, we have to go through the normal uh, process. If she agrees and he agrees, the marriage can take place, you know, after the agreement. This woman, when she came to the Prophet Sallallahu and she asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, my, I'm giving myself to you as a gift. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at her and then he brought his head down. It looks like he doesn't have interest, right? So he kept quiet and she's still having a hope. Maybe he will change his mind. Yeah, but because, because she is looking for who? Rasulullah, right? So, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi kept quiet and she is standing uh, next to him. She did not go and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi did not say anything. One of the companions uh, who was next to the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, Ya Rasulullah, it looks like you don't have any interest. If you don't have Ya Rasulullah, I have interest. And SubhanAllah, she said, she agreed. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, do you have something that you can pay as a maha? He said, no, SubhanAllah. Yeah, that's in the past, right? Nowadays, the first thing to be questioned when you look for marriage is what? Ferrari. Do you have Ferrari or which car do you have? No. Although it is not advisable for a person to go and marry unless if he is in the critical situation to marry without having the enough financial support. Because the scholar said the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man istafa'a minkum al ba'ata fa Al-ba'ah, they said he is referring to financial capability and also physical capability, right? But in the time of the Prophet also marriage has been made very simple, very simple. That's why this person said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have anything. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him to go and check. He checked and he couldn't find anything. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, you still want? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, you don't have anything? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, except my garment. Uh, he has one piece of garment that he is covering his aura. The Prophet Sallallahu said, but there is no way for us to take it from you because how do you work after that? You know? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Hal ma'aka, ma'aka Quran? You know? Nowadays it will be disrespect, you know, people will be making fun of her if she married with the Quran. But that person, he married her, you know, with the Quran he memorized from the Prophet Sallallahu 
the mahar is to teach her that portion of of the of the quran um Sulaim, when uh, abu salama came to her and he wanted to marry her and he wasn't a muslim you know she she told him yeah it is not easy to reject somebody like you but you are not a muslim and we are not allowed to marry a kafir he said what should i do for me to get this another also evil thing we consider in our society you know a, a person converting to islam and marrying because of that we see it as something which is not sincere as if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to check the heart of the people the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, i'm sorry umm sulaim told him you should go to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and accept islam and if you accept islam your islam is my is my mahar he went to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and accept islam and they used to consider the mahar of that uh, sister the mother of anas ibn malik to be the best the best mahar Wallahi, only if we come back to this system, then we will enjoy peace and also society that's free from all of these social illnesses that we're suffering from. We talk a lot about what is going on in our society because we block the means which is opened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it so difficult. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu they block all the means that can lead to zina, an illegal relationship, but at the same time they open the marriage, they make it very, very, very possible. People are running away from it. Their parents are looking for them to, to marry. Nowadays, the children are chasing the parent and the parent are running away, running away from it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married uh, Khadija, according to the best opinion, Wallahu Alam, uh, that I found uh, some of the historian to authenticate the chain of narration. He was at the age of uh, 25 and she was uh, 40. So she's older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with how many years? 15, 15 years. So 15 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's also good for us to know this, that uh, in marriage, you focus on what? You focus on quality, you know, not the way the person is yeah, although it's also a purpose, you know, a, pur a person to look at that person to make sure that he will be comfortable to stay with him. But the first thing that you should be focusing on should be the should be the quality. The first thing should be the quality. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you look at his life, he married somebody who is 15 years older than him, and he also married somebody who is at the age of his grand daughter that's Aisha radiallahu anha with no apologies sometimes we try to apologize and modify the age no it cannot be modified this is a fact in the history the scholar said history cannot be abrogated you do the nasq in everything but not history right the age of Aisha when she married the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was six when the prophet sallallahu alayhi when she was taken to rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam she was at the age of nine Whatever person is going to call it, let him call, call, call that marriage. But history has confirmed that that was the most successful marriage. There was no complaint in it. And nowadays, we are talking about this, criticizing Rasulullah wasallam and some Muslim communities because of these early marriages. But at the same time, you have in primary schools, you have in secondary school, you have this illegal relationship is taking place with our children. You know, and nobody is there to talk about it. But when it happens legally, everyone will come and say this is injustice and unfairness, even if that happens with the agreement of the partner herself. So this is uh, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha and her marriage to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, she got the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of his children with the exception of one. Who was that person that did not come from Khadija radiallahu anha? Ibrahim, he come from which wife? Maria, right? Wrong. <laughs> from who? Maimuna, wrong. Actually, very wrong. Even that one is closer. Wrong. Just now somebody said Maria, and I said wrong. So you give up? Or you don't want to give up? Just give up. This this man is telling me my time is up. <laughs> which wife is that? Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? Who was his mother? And which wife? What was the name of that wife? <laughs> so let me talk on your behalf. I assume that you gave up, right? So let me take over. Okay, the, 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 the answer is Maria. Is there anyone who mentioned Maria? Yeah. 
But you said his wife, Maria, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu never had a wife called Maria. Yeah, she, she, she was a freed slave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the slave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Illa ala azwajim aw ma malakat aymanum. She was in a wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was the only child that did not come from Khadija. I'm about to, to stop inshallah. The rest of the children, all the brothers and the sisters, they came from Khadija radiallahu anha according to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I heard one of the losers saying that none of them was from Khadija except Fatima. May Allah guide him and guide his, his aql. So all of them, they came from Khadija radiallahu anha. We have Al-Qasib, we have Al-Tayyib, we have Al-Tahir. And then we have from the, uh, from the, from the sisters, you have Zainab, you have Umm Kulthum, you have Ruqayya, you have Fatima radiallahu Anha. All of them died in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except Fatima radiallahu anha. She lived until after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She died six months after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a very nice and excellent uh, wife. And inshallah in the next uh, session, I will be talking about the virtues of Khadija. And then I will go a bit, uh, you know, more through that kind of life she was having with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and talk about that in a bit more detail, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, and sorry for taking more than uh, the time being yeah. given to me. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala mu'uthi rahmatil alameen and nabiyina wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Amma ba'd. So, alhamdulillah, we are back to continue with this uh, a good uh, mission, inshallah. And uh, last time I promised to talk about uh, the manaqib and the, the virtues of uh, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha. Uh, she married the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as I said, based on those uh, qualities she, she sees in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She was so rich, very, very rich. But uh, still, because she wasn't looking for somebody who is like her, regardless of his attitude, she was looking for manners. That's why she agreed to take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as her spouse. So she married the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and had an excellent life with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, subhanAllah, I don't think this life of Khadija with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needs any description. Uh, by the way, and inshallah, I guess whoever is going to be speaking about Aisha radiallahu anha should touch this topic uh, a lot about inside the house of the, the spouses. Yani what you hear, what you hear nowadays is tragedy. Almost every single second to some is all about clashes between the husband and, and the wife. Marital relationship became, you know, marital life became something that is compulsory upon both uh, spouses to accept it because of the link that happened to be between them who is the the child and the children that Allah SWT gave them. Many families, they are just living together because of, because of this. That's why we need to see the history properly because women are complaining and the men are also complaining. You know, if you approach each and every one of them will tell you different uh, stories. But I believe the main cause uh, of all of these problems that we are suffering from in our family life, it is simply because we are detaching ourselves to the life of the predecessors. The best life is the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He Allah. Go and check the way he used to live with Khadija. Although very little information have been given, but you can imagine a person who lost his wife, but he kept on remembering Khadija in the way even the most beloved person got annoyed with that. I guess whoever is going to talk about Aisha should touch this because it's really important and crucial to the kind of life we are living, living nowadays. So she had that excellent life and she has been a support and a senate for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the virtues of Khadija is that she is the first wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not marry any other woman together with her. Never married. Even Aisha Radiallahu Anha said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married me three years after the demise of Khadija Radiallahu, radiallahu Anha. He never combined between Khadija and, and somebody else. So he married Sauda, the second person after the demise of 
Khadija. And who was the one who proposed to the Prophet Sallallahu to marry Sauda? Who gave the Prophet Sallallahu the proposal? Because when he lost Khadija, a sister, one of the the good ones, insha'Allah, she went to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said, somebody like you cannot stay without, without a wife. So he said, but who can give me uh, his a daughter at this, you know, circumstance? You know, he was persecuted, you know, he was still in Mecca. So the Prophet Sallallahu did not anticipate to get somebody who can give him his daughter. So she told the Prophet Sallallahu leave the case with me. So he said, who was in your mind? And then she told him two people. One of them was Aisha and the second one was a soda. Uh, unfortunately for Aisha, when she, uh, that uh, sister went to the father to, I mean, to ask his permission, Aisha, uh, I mean, the father already promised somebody to give him the hand of Aisha in the future when he decided to marry. So he has been keeping that promise, but the person did not convert to Islam yet. So Abu Bakr, when he heard about uh, the Rasulullah sallam, having interest in his in uh, his daughter, he was so happy. But Subhanallah, he did not know what to do with the with that promise. No. He did not know what to do with that with the promise. So Inshallah, whoever the, is going to talk about Aisha radiallahu anha, you should ask him to complete this story there. Inshallah, Taala. So what is the name? I come back to my question. What is the name of that person who proposed to the Prophet sallam, to marry after the demise of Khadija? Everything you don't know, right? And the one you mentioned is going to be wrong. And just now another thing also happened. Usually when you have this kahoot, kahoot you call it, who is winning? Sisters. But what happened this year? So after the corona things have changed. Eh? <laughs> anyway, her name is Khawla bint Hakim. The wife of who? Uthman ibn Mad'un, one of the most excellent and awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, who died in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina, and the first person to be buried in, in, in Baqiyah, right? And uh, when he died, his wife, she said, Ashhadu anna Allah qad akramak. She said, I swear by Allah, or I witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honor you. You know, according to the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you cannot confirm Jannah or hell to somebody who is still alive. You can't say that this person is going to Jannah and this person is going to, to hell because you don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to complete their life. To get an idea, if somebody dies, you know, even if he dies at the battlefield, do we call him Shaheed? Do we call him Shaheed? Yeah, nowadays even the non-Muslims also are called Shuhada, you know. I don't know how does that work, but Islamically, you don't look at him and say, this is shaheed. Because who confirms his shahada and his intention? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Muslim, you are supposed to say, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept him as a shaheed. Because somebody died in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during one of the battles, and he was sitting next to him, and uh, an unknown arrow came and got him on his neck. So he died instantly. The companion said, Hani Allahu bil Jannah. He said, This person got a free gift of Jannah. Just like that. The Prophet وسلم, said, Kalla wallah. Inna shamlat allati ghallaha la tashta'ilu alayhi fi qabrihi nara. He said, No, Allah. That piece of cloth that he has taken from the booties before it get to be distributed is now being made as a fire in his, in his grave. According to the companions, he died in the battlefield. He is Shaheed. That's why when they see that person whose name was Qusman or Qasman, you know, in, during one of the battles, and the companions of the Prophet said, oh, this person is doing the great job. But then the Prophet said, but he is going to, to hell. You know, SubhanAllah, it was very difficult for them to understand because according to what they see, he is fighting for the sake of Allah. But who is the one who can judge that which is in the heart, you know? We don't know except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't know what exactly is in the heart of the person. The Prophet sallallahu said this person is going to hell. And what happened to him after the battle? They found him dead. One of the companions was monitoring him. When he was badly injured, that man, he took his sword and killed himself. What did he do? He committed suicide. And you know, suicide in Islam is the shortest and the easiest way to make it to hell. 
you get the idea. So that's why we don't say this person is going to hell and this person is going to paradise unless if we have evidence uh, from the uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that said that said so. Other than that, we have to leave people to Allah subhanahu uh, subhanahu wa taala. You get it. So Uthman ibn Madhun, when he died, his wife said, "I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa taala honored you." That means you are going to to paradise. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her. He said, what are you talking about? How do you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him? He said, I am a messenger, the messenger of Allah. And I don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do with me and also you as well. And subhanallah. That's why as long as you live in this life, you should always have this side of fear in you that you might go in the wrong direction because this will motivate you to keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for guidance. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is there anyone who imagined Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be misguided? No. But every night the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he prayed, Aisha used to hear him saying, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. SubhanAllah, in this life we have seen people who have been expert in tawheed, guide to the humankind. They changed to what? To mulhideen, atheists, people who don't accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason why the Prophet sallallahu when Aisha told him, Ya Rasulullah, you ask, always you ask in Allah this question, uh, I mean this request, you're making this dua, because Ya Muqallib al-Qulub Thabit Qalbi al means you are asking Allah, the one who controls the heart, to help you to maintain your religion until you meet him. And this is Rasulullah asking for this. So Aisha was asking why? You are Rasulullah and you're also afraid of this. He said, Yes, ya Aisha, in al qulubu bayna isba'in min asabi al rahman yuqallibuha kayfaisha. Because the heart of the creation are between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he turns it in the way he wants. So the Prophet said, I don't know. So if Rasulullah is asking for guidance, we should ask for guidance much, much more. So I hope, inshallah, all of us will take it very seriously because, honestly speaking, my dear brothers and sisters, we're living in a very contaminated uh, a time. The time has no problem, but the kind of life we're having is, uh, subhanAllah, so distorted. It's very easy for a person to, to tilt and go in, in the wrong way. So that, therefore, you should read a lot about these hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu to teach you how to maintain your, maintain your, your patience. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the companions, he says, behind you, there are going to be days of patience. He says, the one who is holding upon his religion will be similar to somebody who is holding upon a piece of fire. And subhanAllah, sometimes if you are holding upon your religion with no compromise, you know, to every, uh, any part of it, you will feel that you are living alone. As the Prophet said, but al-Islamu gharibun, wa say'udu gharibun, fatuba li lil ghuraba. So Uthman, Uthman ibn Maz'un, when he died and she said this, the Prophet told her, do not say this because we don't know what exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to uh, treat him with when he meets him. But we have a good expectation that he is going to be given the best by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they, they, they mentioned that the companions of the Prophet took it very difficult for them to, to handle this information from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Until the time, because everyone knows that uh, Uthman ibn Madhun was a very, very dedicated person to uh, Islam, according to what appears to us. And he was like that. Because his wife, she saw him in a dream, and in front of him there is a river. To get an idea, in front of him there is a river. So she told the Prophet ﷺ about the dream. The Prophet ﷺ said, that's a very nice dream. And this is actually his righteous deed that Allah SWT is making them continuous. To get an idea. And that's why the dreams, can we translate the dream? Is it possible to, to interpret the dream? Yes. yes, right. Is it good to do that? You have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ar-ru'ya ala rijli ta'ib. That's why if you take my advice, because you receive a lot of you know, requests from people, they see this, they see that. They want an interpretation for that dream. And subhanAllah, sometimes when, he, when the answer and the interpretation is given, it might cause them depression, which will take a longer time you know, before it is healed in, the, in their life. That's why what must you do when you see a bad dream? Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that dreams are categorized into three categories, right? Dreams that are from Allah, and you have the dreams which are from Shaitan, and you have dreams which are from Hadith.
uh, when you decided to travel to the place which you are really interested in going to that place. Sometimes you see a dream that you are in an aeroplane, you are doing this and that. These are all the trans you are thinking of, of doing. You have those one from Shaitan, these are the nightmares. This one the Prophet said he shouldn't narrate them to, to others. And you have the, the organize and arrange dreams. When I say arrange dreams, means mean a dream that is very straightforward, that doesn't look strange. This one could be interpreted, but the Prophet said you shouldn't narrate them to anyone except a scholar or somebody who really loves you. But the question remains, who is that person? that is going to be honest in translation, uh, translating that dream. So that's why when you see something which you're not happy with, what must you do? You do that which Rasulullah asks you to do. Spit three times in the left side and ask Allah to protect you from shaitan and the evil watch of what you saw and ask Allah to protect you. He said, inshallah, it will not happen to you. It will not take place. That's better than going to somebody who might interpret it in the wrong way and your life will become uh, miserable. You get the idea. So it's important uh, for us to know uh, to know this. You can go and interpret it if you wish, but uh, you have to be very careful. The Prophet said, They said dreams are something that is hanging on the leg of a bird. They will keep on hanging until the time somebody put them into interpretation, then they will they will happen. You get the idea. So as long as you ask Allah to protect you, inshallah, it will never never take place. Is there any way for me to make my dreams, true dreams and to stay away from the nightmares? Yes, if you sleep according to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is there anything called sunnah sleeping? Yes, right. What is that? You sleep according to the sunnah, right? You make, du you make the dua the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I used to do. The idn Allah Azza wa Jalla in most instances you're going to have empty uh, sleeping with no dream except the good the good ones and the scholars said according to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the more truthful you are the more true your dreams is going to become especially in the time we are living in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said before the day of judgment la takadu ru'ya al mu'min takdhib he says before the day of judgment it will be very difficult for see for you to see a dream that was seen by a believer which is going to be false he will be seeing things, but when uh, they, they will take place exactly in the way he saw them in, in the dream. Why is this happening? The scholar said, because at that time, you are technically alone. You are face, uh, facing a lot of pressure from the workplace uh, and from the community, from your house. So it's like you're living alone. So Allah SWT has given you this ru'ya uh, as-saliha. You know, whenever you see something, it will happen to give you some comfort so that you will Understand that you are not alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always in you, in your side. So this uh, Uthman ibn Mas'un is one of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bi shahadati and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Khadija was the first wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I said, he never married anyone uh, before Khadija. And also during the time of Khadija, he did not marry anyone uh, at all. One of the virtues of uh, uh, Khadija is that she was the first person to accept Islam. Uh, Ibn al-Athir, uh, Isuddin Ibn al-Athir said, according to the uh, narration of uh, al-Zahabi, he said, it is a consensus of all the Muslims that Khadija was the first person to accept Islam from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's very, very obvious, right? Because the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew that he was a prophet and a messenger of Allah SWT when he was with, with Khadija. And in fact, actually the first time when he saw the, uh, the, the angel, you know, Jibreel alayhi salam, and he came back home, that was when, he's, uh, when he used to go to the cave of Hira, right? What was he doing in the cave of Hira? He used to go to the cave of Hira. What was he doing in the cave of Hira? Are you sure he was meditating? I like that one, contemplating and reflection, right? Meditation, I guess, is the one that you close your eyes and think, keep imagining things, right? Is it good for a person to do it as a Muslim? No answer? So cancel the Kahoot, you know? They already fail, you know? Okay, I know most of us are interested in you know, taking the terms and the terminologies given to us by others. 
But subhanAllah, I, I wish each and every one of you, you know, and I hope every one of you will open his ears, you know, to listen to this uh, statement of mine. Whatever wisdom you are looking for, with no doubt, it is there in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Billah, every wisdom you are looking for, which will guide you to the truth and lead you to success in this life, it is there in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the way you don't need to take from others. I'm not saying benefiting from others is wrong. No, you can do it. But why would you go to somebody after having the most valuable ideas given to you by somebody who is divinely guided? Who is guiding Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In every statement he mentioned that is the truth and he never made a mistake in those statements. That's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَاتَّبِعُهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَحْتَدُونَ if you want the guidance in everything, you have to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in his cultural practices, if you follow him, Wallahi, you will succeed in life. Unfortunately, we live in a, time, in a time whereby the Muslims are praising others, you know, and you rarely see others praising what we have. When we quote, we quote from them. We write, we write. You know, you see a person when he quote from the Quran as if, you know, he is forced to do that. He just quote one word from it. But he has all the courage and, you know, to go and quote from others the whole thing and put it in his article and his writing. SubhanAllah. That's why we are in the state of loss and others are laughing at us. They don't quote from us and we are quoting from them. But don't take me in the wrong way. I'm not saying quoting from them is wrong. You know, you can benefit from them. But you have the best one with you, which is divinely given to you that and that is the statement of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There is a scholar who wrote a book when he sees the Muslims in that community where he lives uh, focusing always on a book when it comes to akhlaq and manners and attitude. They focus on a book written by one of the one of the non-Muslims. It's okay to benefit from it but the way the community are praising that book you know force him to write another book refuting that you know attitude of the community saying fi akhlaqina kifaya we have more than enough and he emphasized on this fact that i have been mentioning that whatever you need in this life to succeed trust me my dear brothers and sisters it is there in the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam all that you have to do is to look for it if you couldn't find it as the scholars be even lahi azza wa jalla somebody is going to guide you to what is the best so coming back to the meditation uh, issue this meditation is a word that we took from from others and subhanallah because we don't follow up what is going on and we claim that it is beneficial because people got relief from their pressure and depression and all of these things and trust me my dear brothers and sisters it is what i call temporary solution you know you know those muhaddiats they give us when you are sick you are in pain they give you some painkillers you know relaxes you know to give you some relief but after that what happened the sickness come back because the sickness is actually there inside you. But it is not apparent because of those, uh, you know, uh, pills that you're taking, which are disguising the true image of you at that, at that moment. This is how I see those things. But subhanallah, the truth has come out according to the research being done by some of the, uh, the Muslims, which they also extracted from the confession of those people who are not Muslims. The vast majority of these uh, practices and of with continuous depression and attempt to kill themselves. And also at the end of the day, what nobody is waiting for has arrived, which is the confession from non-Muslims and no Muslims also who are doing. I heard one of the spiritual fathers are saying, I mean, he is saying that the Rusul, you know, Rasulullah Azza wa Jalla, they are still coming. We're still having Rasulullah Azza wa Jalla. That's against the ijma of all the Muslimin. Who is the last messenger of Allah? Rasulullah. Meditation has led him to believe that Rusul are still coming, including yourself, he said. And he brought people who are confessing that when they are doing that meditation, you know, subhanAllah, they have, they have a face coming to them. One of them says, I see a wajh murabba, you know, a face which is a square coming to me and telling me that you are this, you are that, you are this, you are that. So we have a replacement mentioned by, by Sheikh, which is based on what? Tadabbur. In the Quran, Allah SWT asked ask you to do what? Tadabbur. But tadabbur is based on something that is physical, tangible. You see it in front of you. You watch, you read, you ponder, you understand. You, make, you extract lesson from it. Not to go and sit down because trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, 
when you sit down and you start thinking this is when the negative and evil thoughts will come. Although you might see it being good because this is what shaitan wants to do, to distract you from the one that Allah SWT gave you in the Quran, which is, which is the tadabbur. So let us fix that thing which we usually use when we define what the Prophet SallAllahu is doing in the cave of Hira. It was reflection. That's that tahannus that Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi used to stay away from the community to go and have that privacy in the cave. And Khadija radiallahu anha, she used to support him. He used to stay there. Whenever he needs support, he would come down to Khadija and get some and then go back to that place until the time Jibreel alayhi salam met him for the first time. And you already know what happened. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi came back to, where did he go? After he saw Jibreel alayhi salam for the first time. And by the way, how many times the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Jibreel? Wrong. <sighs> Correct. <laughs> yeah, because I said how many times he saw him. I did not say how many times he saw him in his correct, uh, I'm sorry, in his original form, right? Yeah, that's your answer is correct when he said two. Yeah, he saw him twice, jibri, jibri. But seeing an angel, you know, in the form of somebody else like human beings, the Prophet saw him many times. But in the form of angel, he saw him twice. One of them is in the heaven when he went to the Isra wal Miraj, and the other one is here on, on earth. So he saw Jibreel alayhi salam for the first time. He got scared of him. Where did he go? Went to his office. <laughs> Do you imagine if somebody is looking for support nowadays, how many people, if you got scared, you go home? You go home because you know that there is somebody who will really give you comfort, or you run away to the Tabib. You, know? <laughs> you go to another planet, right? Not home, right? So that's also another lesson in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Khadija. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not hesitate to go back to, to the house. Why? Because he knows he has somebody there who is very honest with him and who he can consult about what he saw. So that's why when he go to Khadija and he met her in a state of fear, she told him what happened. He said, Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. He said, I'm afraid of what will happen to me. She said, what happened? He told her what happened. Subhanallah, she told him, Kalla wallah. And this shows what? Smartness. And he wallah. You want to succeed in life, make sure that your partner is a smart person. Not somebody who talks too much, but somebody who talks smartly. The good idea, somebody who is capable of guiding you. Somebody who has, inshallah, the solution to your problems. Somebody who remains calm when you need them. And that's what we see in the, in the hospitals, right? You go and you're suffering, you're crying. The medical doctor, do they cry? Maybe you are dying in a moment, but they still tell you, take it easy, right? Imagine if you go to a doctor, you are crying and he is also crying. <laughs> for sure, you're going to go out of his office and look for another person, right? Who can treat you? Very well. So the Prophet ﷺ go to Khadija, and Khadija managed to comfort Rasulullah wasallam, And she told him, don't worry. Let's go to the expert in this field. Maybe we can get some additional information on top of that which I said. You can see the smartness, right? She told him what can give him comfort. She said, people like you cannot be embarrassed in this community. And they shouldn't expect themselves to be in trouble like this, which you are afraid, afraid of based on those qualities, because this is how the community was in those in those days. So she took him to her cousin. Who was that cousin? Waraqa ibn, ibn Nawfal. And Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he was amongst the three people who left the Arabian community. There are some, 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 some other people also who had the same attitude, including Khadija herself. Some people said she refused to worship idols. She refused to take all of those uh, bad attitudes of the, of the Arabs in those days. She focused on values which are universally accepted because they're correct. To get an idea, in the time, of, uh, uh, in the time before Rasulullah Sallam, you have Waraqa ibn Nawfal, you have Zayd ibn Amr, and you have Uthman ibn Harith. Those one, they left the Arabian community because they believe that people are not following the right way. They can't accept the concept of worshiping idols. They believe that this is not the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Waraka ended up accepting uh, a Christianity, and I guess Uthman also somehow, but uh, Zayd ibn Amr, he refused to do 
to accept Christianity or Judaism. That's why he kept on worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the way he believes. He thinks Ibrahim alayhi salam used to do. He used to pray. He used to tell them worshiping idols is not the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He used to go to them if they are slaughtering a sheep. He tell them do not use the name of other than Allah because it doesn't make sense. That one that you're using his name was not the one who created the sheep. And he used to get into trouble from the family because he belongs to the family of Umar. The father of Umar used to put him into trouble because of this attitude. He used to go to the Kaaba. You know, they have their own labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. You know that one, right? What do you call that? A talbiya, right? Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik. And then, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Okay, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka al muk. In the past, they used to take this also, but they add something. To get an idea, they used to say, Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik. And then, illa sharikan huwa lak, tamlik huwa mamalak. They used to say, Labbaik, la sharika lak. They say, Ya Allah, you don't have any partner except the partner that belongs to you. Yani, they have to put shirk in it. They said, except the partner that belongs to you, which you are the one who, who created this partner and you own him and whatever it owns. So Zaid ibn Amr used to go to that place. If he, he hears somebody making the talbiyah, when he reached this place, he would tell him, stop, do not continue. This is what is uh, all about. Uh, this is what the religion of Ibrahim is, is all about. So you have Warqa ibn Nawfal. He did not take that stance. He took Christianity. And it was a very good person who used to translate Christianity into Arabic language and present it to, to the Arabs and whoever approached him. So when the Prophet Sallallahu reached him, he told him, Yabna Akhi, son of my brother, what did you see? The Prophet Sallallahu explained to him what he saw. You know, there, there is a narration which unfortunately is weak. It's quite interesting. Khadija tried to comfort the Prophet Sallallahu in her own way. But that narration, according to what I know, is a weak narration. It says that I'm narrating it to you so that you will know that this narration is a weak narration. We have the case of the waraka, which is more than enough uh, for us. That narration says the Prophet ﷺ came back home and he was scared. Khadija tried to comfort him, but still the fear is there. Because seeing Jibreel and Jibreel doing the, those things to, to him, you know. So the Prophet ﷺ was scared. So Khadija told him, if you see him again, please let me know. Okay, according to that narration, right? If you see him again, let me know. And then he told her, yes, he came. She said, okay, come and sit on my, on my lap. The Prophet Sallallahu sat on her lap, the right one. She told him, do you see him? He said, yes, I, I still see him. Okay, sit on the other one. Do you see him? Yes, I see him. And then according to that narration, she took off her, her scarf, you know, and then she told him, do you see him? He said, no, he disappeared. So she told him, according to that narration, that, yeah, this is not shaitan. This is an angel. This narration is weak. But is it a fact that angels don't come to the house when a woman takes off her clothes to sleep? Is it true? Say yes. Just say yes. I will not say wrong. Okay. Yes, it's, it's like that. They have this respect. The angels of mercy, when they come to the place, if a woman already took off her clothes, they don't come to that place. According to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just lied down to sleep, you know, to take rest. And then he heard Jibreel calling him from outside. So Jibreel, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out of, the, out of the house very slowly in the way Aisha would not get scared and she would not wake up because he thought she was sleeping. And Aisha wasn't sleeping. She was waiting for him to come back. But then when she saw him coming in that way, she kept on uh, 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 pretending that she is sleeping. So when the Prophet Sallallahu went out, she thought that Rasulullah Sallallahu is going to another, another wife, right? And today is her, is her turn. So Aisha, what did she do? She let him go. And then she followed Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi kept on going and until the time he reached Baqiya Al-Gharqat. When he reached the Baqiya, he made a long dua for the people in the grave. He made a very long dua. So Aisha, when she saw that, she realized that, okay, that, that's me, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is not going to, to any, any of his wives. So she came back home, but she was rushing, she was running so that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not reach her. Whoever went to Medina, you know that the distance between the house of Aisha and Baqiya is very, very short. 
So when she was uh, running at that high speed, for sure when the Prophet ﷺ reached home, he would find her suffering from heart breathing, right? So the Prophet ﷺ get into the room and he saw her breathing very hardly. He said, Aisha, what happened? What's wrong with you? She said, nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, Aja'aki shaytanuk? Did your shaitan visit you? She, she kept quiet. He said, what happened? She didn't want to tell. He said, Allah is going to tell me if you don't want to tell. And then she started telling him what exactly she was thinking about. So the Prophet so Allah so pushed her uh, from the shoulder. And he said, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger are going to deceive you? And then he told her, I just lied down and then Jibreel alayhi salam called me. I was, I was going slowly because I don't want you to get scared of hearing a voice, but you don't see anyone. So he said, وَمَا كَانَ يَدْخُلَ عَلَيْكِ وَقَدْ وَضَعْتِ فِي عَبَكِ He said, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَدْخُلَ عَلَيْكِ And Jibreel will never get into the place after knowing that you have already taken off your clothes to, to sleep. So this is established that angels, they don't come to the room at that, at that moment, even if that hadith or that a part of the story uh, is, not, is not authentic. So Waraka asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did you say? The Prophet ﷺ, he saw and then that Namus went to Musa alayhi And Namus means Sahib al-Sir, the one who is bringing secrets. So he's referring to Jibreel alayhi salam. You are not speaking the truth. You show me 15 and you cancel it to five minutes in five seconds. So I will add 10 minutes, inshallah. Jazak. So, so he told him, what did you see? He said, I saw this and that. And he told him, this is, uh, this is the angel, the same angel who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam. And then he confirmed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam that this is actually good uh, for you. It is not a bad. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to give me opportunity to see the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send you, I will definitely support support you. So this is part of the contribution that was given by Khadija to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She supported him financially during the the Shi'ib, uh, Abi Talib when they boycotted Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the believers. They were depending on the wealth from Khadija radiallahu anha and some uh, people who can contribute to help them to to survive. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he lost Khadija radiallahu anha, he was very sad. He was, he was so sad. He lost Khadija and few days he lost after Khadija. Uh, in, in few days, he lost also Abu Talib. That one is supporting him politically, you know, by power because he was a leader in Mecca and Khadija is supporting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and defending him financially. So that's why I mentioned that the Mushrikun never harm Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the way they harmed him after the demise of Khadija radiallahu anha. When she died, the Prophet was very sad, was very sad until the time Jibreel came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and comforted him about the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put her. Before I mention this hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to talk about Khadija radiallahu anha much more than anybody else. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I have never beca became jealous of somebody like the way I became jealous of Khadija radiallahu anha and I never met her. She never met Khadija radiallahu anha. Never met her. Uh, so she said, I never saw her, but I was jealous of Khadija because every single moment the Prophet sallallahu is mentioning Khadija. Whenever Khadija comes, you know, or any opportunity the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again, he will talk about Khadija. If they do something wrong, he will tell them, if it is Khadija, she will not do this and that to me. And if the, uh, if somebody knock on the door, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sometimes will wish that this should be one of the, the sisters of Khadija radiallahu anha or one of her friends. And he used to slaughter a sheep and distribute it to the friends of Khadija radiallahu anha. One day Aisha told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said, Ya Rasulullah, you always remember an old woman, Hamra al-Shitqain, the one that has a very red gums. What does she mean? She means that she is too old until the time she lost her teeth. وَقَدْ أَبْدَلَكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا And Allah SWT has replaced her with somebody who is the best for you. The Prophet SAW stopped her. He said, La Wallah, Allah never replaced Khadija with, with the best. That's why, wallahu alam, 
uh, I guess these hadiths, if you look at them, they can close the discussion among the scholars. Who is the best? Khadija or, or uh, Khadija or Aisha radiallahu anha. You get it? Who is the best? If you look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and you focus on them, for sure you're going to pray, it, uh, uh, you're going to favor Khadija radiallahu anha. First of all, she's among those four sisters that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said they are the best sisters ever created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I guess this should be more than more than enough, although the scholars, they have their own dimension of thinking sometimes. Because the Prophet sallallahu said the best that Allah subhanahu wa created amongst the sisters are these, these four. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she is not one of, one of the four. Although she is the best, you know, after those ones, then Aisha should come uh, the second or the next uh, the next one. And one more thing also that can favor Khadija radiallahu anha over Aisha radiallahu anha, wallahu alam, is this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu said to Aisha, Allah has never replaced Khadija with somebody who is who is the best. And one more thing that I found to be the strongest evidence to make this preference is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deal with uh, both uh, cases. In the case of Aisha radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting down. But before Aisha, let's start with Khadija first. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting down with Jibreel alayhi salam. Subhanallah, something very beautiful happened, which I urge each and every one of us to go deeper and deeper and learn about Khadija. And all of those uh, companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to see who they were, who they were before. Because some of them were walking on earth and they know they're going to paradise. Allah is something that worth reading. You know, and doing research, how did they manage to make this success in their life whereby he is working on earth and he knows he's going to paradise? For sure, they do not get it, you know, out of sleeping. They work for it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Woman arad al akhirata wa sa'alaha sa'iha. They were not sleeping, they work for it. And they reach that situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked to some of them. Through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, If alu ma shi'tum fa inni qad gafartu lakum. He said, do whatever you want because I forgive all of your sins. Although they are not like us to go and do whatever they want, those ones have, found to be, have been found to be the most dedicated people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they worry so much, you know, of the consequence of their life in the, in the future. Although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the paradise, but they never relax, I mean, rely upon, upon this. Is that clear? So Khadija is one of them. You know, she reached a situation whereby when Jibreel alayhi salam was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was enjoying the speech and the talk with Jibreel alayhi salam and then Jibreel told him, Ya Rasulullah, this is Khadija is coming to us. He said, uh, she is holding food or sharab or something to drink. He said, if she comes, please tell her that Allah SWT has sent me to convey his salam to her. Subhanallah. Who is saying the salam to her? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ya Rasulullah, if she comes also, please tell her that I am saying salam to her. Subhanallah. I have never come across a person who received this from Allah. All the way from the heavens to have an angel come into that person, you know, to convey the salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that uh, person. That that's, as I said, is really, 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 I mean, a motivator, you know, for us to go and read about this uh, woman to see how did she manage to reach this, this position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, when a person reaches this, that means he is done. Bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a person, he will call Jibreel alayhi salam and tell him, Ya Jibreel, I love so and so. And as such, you shall love him. And then Jibreel will call the rest of the angels and tell them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves so and so and so person. And you also should love him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put your love on, on earth. And my dear brothers and sisters, with no exaggeration, one of the best protection you have in this life is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa was sent to, to whose house? Musa alayhi salam. Where did Allah send him? To the house of Harun. Fir'aun. Who was Fir'aun? The worst entity at that time, who claims to be Allah, not just claiming to be Allah, he said he's on top of Allah. And Musa was wanted. That man killed not less than 17,000 children trying to get Musa السلام, because his magician told him that somebody is about to come who will, will be the end of your kingdom. So he has been looking for Musa. But subhanAllah, look at what Allah did. Allah refused to let Musa stay 
in his in his house next to his mother. He sent him to the house of his enemy. Most likely you will never find a person that Allah called him my enemy after Firaun, before and after Firaun. He said, Ya Khuthu Aduulli wa Aduullah. He is going to be taken by my enemy and his enemy. And subhanallah, did he do anything against Musa alayhi salam? No. Was there any angel that was there to protect Musa alayhi salam? We are not told about that. But Allah says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي وَلِتُسْنَ عَلَىٰ عَهِنِي What protected Musa alayhi salam was the love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, today, I'm going, or tomorrow, I'm going to give the flag to somebody who loves Allah and Allah loves him. This is during the battle of Khaybar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, tomorrow I'm going to give the flag to somebody who loves Allah and Allah loves him. Umar radiallahu anhu said, I never look for leadership until that time. Why were they looking for it? Because Rasulullah so said, Allah loves that person. And you know what does that mean? Because everyone claims that he loves Allah. But as the scholars have mentioned, the real question is about whether Allah SWT loves you or not. Because you have to weigh your actions and uh, your iman, you know, with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the book of Allah SWT to see whether you are doing the correct thing or not. Because this is what would determine whether you are a true lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. That's why they call that ayah in Surah Al-Imran, Ayat Al-Imtihan, the ayah of the test. Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ If you claim that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many times in our life we are forced to make a decision whether we go with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves or we go with, with that which our desire wants or what somebody is dictating to us. And we think that we have a second thought. Islamically, by virtue of the word Islam, whenever there is a choice between Allah and somebody else, there is only one option, which is to go with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter, no matter what. So if I claim that I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in my business, I am dealing with haram things. In my relationship with others, I am dealing with haram things. That means my love is, is fake. So my dear brothers and sisters, aim for this in all of your activities to reach that level of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way you truly love Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, loves you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed by Jibreel alayhi salam that Allah is saying salam to Khadija radiallahu anha that's more than enough as a virtue. But when it comes to Aisha radiallahu anha when she came Jibreel alayhi salam told him Ya Rasulullah this is Aisha coming to you and if she reach, uh, she reach you please tell her that I am saying salam to her. Not like the case of Khadija, Allah SWT is conveying this, uh, Allah SWT is saying salam to you, and also say my salam, but in the case of Aisha radiallahu anha, he said Allah SWT, uh, I'm sorry, I'm the one who is saying the, the salam. So this is uh, Khadija radiallahu anha with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I have some other things that I have prepared for this, but unfortunately that man has been telling me my time is, is, uh, is up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good. So Khadija lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the vast majority of, uh, uh, I mean, she is the, the wife that stayed with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mostly, more than any, any, anybody else, because she stayed with him before the, the, the Risala and also after, after, the, after the, the Risala. So she died after the Shi'ad Abi Talib, and she was buried in a place which is called Al Hajjul. They said this place in Makkah, this is the place where they usually bury the family of Khadija. So when she died, they also put her in, in that place. So as I said, the Prophet Sallallahu was very sad when he lost Khadija and he has to. Until the time Allah SWT informed him that going back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is better for her because she is right now in Firdaus, in that house which, uh, right now in Al-Jannah, in that house which uh, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made it from. Al-Qasab. Qasab, they said, is Al-Lu'lu'l Mujawwaf. And this is a jewelry, you know, is a house which is made by the jewelry. That kind of nice and fancy place. And there is no fatigue, there is no weariness, and there is no worry in that place. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became happy because he knows that what Allah SWT has for her is, is better for her. Is she going to be the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in Jannah? Is she going to be the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Jannah? Any evidence for that? I 
I know everyone knows the answer, but unfortunately, when it comes to justification, they always keep quiet. Is she going to be the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah? Why? Yeah, always there is a hadith. Which hadith? <laughs> it's Yusuf. Which hadith? He has to check Google. Yeah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Al-mar'atu li akhiri azwajiha. A, a, a woman will be with the last husband she lived with in this in this life. And also in the uh, uh, story of Aisha radiallahu anha, when she went to uh, participate, not in the battle, but to reconcile between the Muslims when they're fighting each other during the time of uh, Ali bin Abi Talib. Uh, Ammar bin Yasu was talking to uh, the believers. He says, I know that she's the wife of Rasulullah was zawjatuhu fil jannah and also his wife in, in, in Jannah, supporting that hadith. So all of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu we hope if even Allah Azza wa Jalla, they are going to be with Rasulullah uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in Jannah. So may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant you tawfiq and all of us, and may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accept your patience. Uh, thank you very much. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us among uh, those people who will succeed in this life and the hereafter, and combine us with uh, people like Khadija and the rest of the messengers of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in Firdaus al-A'la, إنه بكل جميل كفيل سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we will move to the two minute sessions. Uh, if you are yet to ask your questions, you may scan the QR code on the screen and you can ask them now. I do have a few questions here, and mashallah, brothers have asked really good questions. And sisters also ask the questions. So, moving on to the first question, Sheikh, could you tell us about the story of the necklace? It was on the poster. Which one? What is that? Necklace? Which one? <laughs> I don't know which, how many necklaces we have on earth? <laughs> You're referring to the, the story of the necklace of Aisha, the one she borrowed from her sister? No, no, the, the which one? The one she brought. Oh, the necklace of, uh, the, the necklace of uh, Zainab, which she got from, from her, her mother, Khadija. How do I know what's, what's, what is behind it? Yeah. What I, all that I know is that she gave it to her daughter and she presented this when the, the husband, Abu Al-As, was amongst those who were captured by the Prophet Sallallahu as a war prisoner during the Battle of Badr. So she sent it to the Prophet Sallallahu and she asked him permission to use this, uh, this as, as a ransom to free her, her husband, Abu Las. He wasn't a Muslim at that time. He came to fight the, the, the believers. Uh, so she sent this. When the Prophet Allah saw it, and he was so sad because it reminds him about Khadija radiallahu, radiallahu anha. Yeah, it reminds him about Khadija radiallahu, radiallahu anha. So that's uh, all I know. But other stories, how did she get it? How did she use it? This one I... I have no idea, but after this, I know that yes, it is established in the history that she gave it to her daughter Zainab, uh, radiallahu anha, and Zainab was once presenting it to the uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and the believers to use it as a ransom to free her, her husband. Yeah, Allah grant us good. Allah, Allah, Allah. Um, second question: We know that after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the wives can't marry other people. Is it a command of Allah, and what is the hikmah behind it? Yes, they cannot marry anyone, and nobody is allowed to marry them. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "La hilu la kan nisa u min badu wa la anta badla bihinna min azwajin." He says, uh, 
إن تبدو شيئا أو تخفو ولا أن تنكه أزواجه أب من بعده أبدا الله سبحانه وتعالى في سورة الأحزاب he said it is not permissible for anyone to marry the wife of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم after he uh, after he died you know أبدا forever يعني first of all they are called the the wives of the uh, the mothers of the the believers they are acting like a mother to us not the biological mothers but in terms of marriage and in terms of guidance and in terms of tarbiyah they are acting like like our like our mothers and also you know when you marry and then uh, somebody is going to marry that that person again you know i don't call it there is no disrespect in it but you understand what i'm what i'm talking about it might not be appropriate with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know for a fact that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is prohibited he cannot divorce those ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says la ihlu lakan nisa'u min ba'du there was a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped him from marrying uh, additional uh, wife and uh, he told him also you cannot replace this one with others yeah he divorced the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the wives of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi he divorced her who was who was her? Uh, who was she the wife that was divorced by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so say it louder who was that? Hafsa, right? Hafsa bin to Uthman, right? Or bin to who? Umar radiallahu an, right? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam divorced her, and then uh, Jibril came to him. Subhanallah. You see how manners and attitude are saving uh, people, right? Your righteousness should be the 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 savior for you in your life. You know, Jibril came immediately after the divorce. He told him, Allah SWT is instructing you to, to take her back immediately. How can you divorce somebody who is very dedicated to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? So she went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi because of that. Look at how Allah SWT stands for her. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had to take her back because of what? Her righteousness. Right? That's why they said people marry you because of the beauty. The beauty of wealth, the beauty of the, the face and the beauty of the, the position. And the beauty of the religion. The only beauty that doesn't fade is the beauty of the religion. And that's the secret actually behind focusing on the religion be before any other beauty. Because if you marry a person because of the religion, that one will not go be even like as, well, as long as the person is still practicing the religion. And that will make you blind in the way the change, the, the physical change that is taking place, you know, in the in the spouse, you will not witness it that, that much. That's why they live for ages, you know, subhanAllah, without having a clash amongst them. I recall one of the best examples of this kind of life where a Sha'bi said he married a person and he lived with her for 20 years without seeing anything that made him sad. You know, what kind of life is this? Compare this life with the life in this uh, time of time of, uh, of ours. So it's totally, it's totally uh, uh, different. So we have to focus on uh, minus and and, uh, and and attitude and so uh, uh, and behavior. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam divorced Hafsa, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala commanded him to to take her back. There is another wife also. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam divorced. Who was that? For sure, if for sure, if Hafsa, you have doubts, this one you're going to miss her for sure. I can talk on your behalf that you forgot to be be nice to you, right? You forgot. You remember a, sister, a, a, a woman called Ibn Atil Jawd? Yeah, he married her. And the first time the Prophet ﷺ met her, somebody told her that if you meet him, you should tell him, A'udhu Billahi Mink. SubhanAllah. They told her, if you want to be very close to him, you should tell him this right after he met you. So the Prophet ﷺ met her and she told him, A'udhu Billahi Mink. And you know, Rasulullah ﷺ was a very simple person. When she told him, A'udhu Billahi Mink, the Prophet ﷺ said, you definitely uh, um, sought the protection of somebody who protests. Go back to your, to your family. You know, they don't even have any relationship. That was the end of that, of that marriage. Other than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you are not allowed to divorce any of them. And uh, you're not allowed to marry another woman. And they also are not allowed to marry uh, somebody after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And some scholars said, because naturally people will be thinking, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi died, I will take this, I will take that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed that page also. He told them, in to do shay'an, out to fu'u fa'inna Allah ka'ana bi kulli shay'in alima. If you were to hide something, 
in your heart, you know, or you expose it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in your in your heart. Even that which is in the heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed it. He said, Don't think, you know, concerning this matter, the pages is closed. So Allah alam, the wisdom behind it is that fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, do it, and they are also considered as as our as our mothers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed that page because they are going to be his his wives in, in Jannah. If they marry somebody else, they will be the wife of uh, they will be the wife of those those people, not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah. Uh, the next question is something confusing. But it's not the position of Malaysia and Allahu anha as a business woman to push the Asian down women apart. And they're equal to men when it comes to wealthy matters. Your thoughts on this, please. In terms of equality in the sense of dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down the risk to who? To man, to the brothers or to the sisters? Salam. The risk of Allah is given to who? All of all of us. You get it. That's why if a woman wants to do business, is it haram in Islam for her to engage in business? No. But the question is, why do we make it a big issue? Honestly speaking, we really need to be very careful because sometimes we promote these things. We kept on doing it because somebody is dictating us. All of these rights, they were there. Believe it or not. Sisters are taking more right in Islam than, than the brothers. True? Yes. If you read Islam correctly, sisters have more right than the brothers. In a way, you might say that if somebody is to protest, there should be the brothers protesting. We're looking for the, the brothers' right, men's right, not sisters' right. But somebody is behind the movement because there is a hidden agenda here. They have a purpose and they have an objective and the reason why they are putting the sisters in front. To make it look like, you know, Islam is not doing anything, you know, to protect the right of the sisters. If you see a society where a sister is in trouble, trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, that society is not following the correct religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe any society that a woman has to work for her to live, that society is not doing the right thing. It's halal for her to, to, to work. But any society that she has to work for her to live, that society is not doing the right thing. The correct approach Islamically is the place where you find a, a sister is the only person who can say, I don't want to work. And there has to be somebody who stands for her and provide her with whatever she, she needs. Whenever you see difficulty, Allah SWT will avoid them from difficulty and put the brothers in the place of difficulty. Naturally, it is like that, actually. Naturally, it is like that. But Islam brought something which is unknown to the world. Sisters in the past are not given the right. They used to be inherited. Actually, not inheriting the property. A sister used to be inherited. Imagine a system, you know, which take them from being killed alive to a system whereby... Now they have a voice, they can talk, you know, and present their opinion. And the Prophet ﷺ will take the advice and voice it out to the community. In the past, in the Arabian Peninsula, they used to kill them alive. Why did they used to kill them? Because they are, because they are, they're women. You know, they used to bury them alive. SubhanAllah. Did we finish this age? I mean, in our time, do we have such a thing? Salam. Do we have such a thing that a person doesn't want to have a baby girl? Yeah. A lot. Well, like the worst I heard is the case which one of the, uh, the scholars, I will not tell you the name, but he was narrating a real case that a person got a baby girl. SubhanAllah, when the Qabila came to him, the midwife, she came with the girl. She gave him the baby. He took the baby to the garbage place and put her. The mother is in blood. She heard the baby screaming and the dogs were around the place. You know, She went, you know, she forgot the pain. She go and uh, brought the girl back. You know. I heard another word story which a person has, the family have to make a decision. It's one of my closest friends also was narrating this uh, 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 story. He said the family had to make a decision because the husband says, if this baby is a girl, he will never stay with the, with the mother. He will divorce her instantly. And they go to the scanners, the ultrasounds, and it tells them this is a girl. He told her, either you abort or, uh, or I will divorce. 
So the family had to meet each other and discuss the matter. At the end of the day, they decided to keep the marriage and to do what? To kill the girl. And they did. And subhanallah, when the baby comes out after being killed, it turns out to be a boy. Subhanallah. But you can see this hatred up to this moment, it is still, it is still there in, in our time. This is not to make the sisters happy, but if you go to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu you find, to my knowledge, you know, I know I have a very, 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 very little, much lesser than what you guys have, but I have never come across a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, if Allah grants you two boys, you will get this and that. But he said, if Allah bless you with two daughters and you're patient and you give them good education, he said they will become sitr for you against hell. They will become your protection against hell. That's, that's a privilege. But unfortunately, when somebody stay away from Islam, you know, we can come up with all of these ideas. So that's, that's why I'm reminding myself and all of us, don't be deceived by all of these uh, the titles that we hear nowadays, women's rights, women's rights. Let's go back to Islam and see what Islam says about each and every one of us. Wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, you will see nothing except beauty. Islam is the only system that brought a, the woman up after they have been neglected. In some communities, believe it or not, go and read the history. In some communities, they are treated like who? Like who? Shayateen. You know that? I was reading one of the books called uh, Audit al-Hijab. You know, the, the, the author quotes some part of the history in some countries. The, the, the community was convening, trying to check and see what is the status of woman. And they have three questions. Number one, is she a human being? Or she is shaitan? Or she is somebody who is working with shaitan? At the end of the day, the conclusion was that she, they agree she is a human being, but she walks with the, with the shaitan. SubhanAllah, all of these, when Islam comes, Islam moved them away. And the Prophet said, and Nisa wa shaqayiku ar-rijal. So business is halal. You don't need to say that you are promoting this idea of uh, woman empowerment for you to establish their right. It is already there in, in Islam. If they study Islam, they will find everything is being provided for them. We don't need to support the kuffar in this agenda for us to make woman somebody. And unfortunately, nowadays, because of this uh, evil approaches, what do we generate? We generate nothing except a lot of divorces. Divorce in our Mus in the Muslim community is at the, the increase. Because we are, go we are going against the nature. Naturally, who is taking the lead in the house? Husband or the wife? Husband, that's part of our nature. It's not about Islam says or Islam does not say this is part of our nature. Even in animals, the male take the lead, provides everything, and the sister stays and take care of uh, the children and other matters of, of the house. When we say he is the leader, it doesn't mean she, she is the subordinate and the slave. No, marital relationship is all about cooperation and partnership and support. But we just need a leader in the house for house control and management. Just like when you travel, you need to have somebody who is leading. When you go for a mission, you need to have somebody who is leading. It is just like that. Yeah, Allah SWT says, But it doesn't mean your wife is, is, your, is your slave. So what I'm saying, we should read Islam correctly. We should read the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu a lot. We shouldn't take Islam from other than the sources given to us by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah grant us good. If the husband doesn't want. Uh, he doesn't want it. Right. She shouldn't do. He was asking if the wife is going to do business and the husband doesn't agree with that. She shouldn't do. She gave the, the wealth to somebody in the family to run the business for her who could be trusted. Or if she can trust the husband, I wish, you know, then she can give him the money to invest on her behalf. Uh, but she shouldn't disobey him if he says she shouldn't go for the, for the business. But this doesn't mean that we're supporting the idea that says a woman is not allowed to use her money except if the husband permitted her. The wealth which the woman earned belongs to who? Belongs to her. The husband doesn't own that money and he is not allowed to touch it without her permission. But since they are living together and he has a right also over her and business necessitate dealing with other males, you know, and we don't know what will happen, the husband does have a right to tell her not to, not to do it and she should understand that and look for other 
a possible and peaceful way to, for her to continue with, with the business, inshallah. The next question, how important is the wife for the wife to follow and respect the husband? Is the wife to operate a piece of language and physically violence for the husband? She should use her magic to control him. <laughs> the Prophet said, he talks in uh, that hadith and it talking to us in the way that you see the smart person being controlled by, by a woman, no matter how much smart he is. That's the reason why the scholar said if she used the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her, she can bring the husband down. Somebody was right when he says, most of the failure in the marriage, the woman should take most of the, the blame because she has the solution. But sometimes, unfortunately, we have this uh, arrogance that is uh, taken from the other other people whose life is not like, like ours. You know, I'm talking about the Western community. To get an idea. So it is very important to have that uh, obedience. You know, as I said, not in the sense of being a slave. She is not a slave of her husband, but to obey him in the way the Sharia had uh, mentioned, you know, in any way which is not uh, going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And honestly speaking, any person who raised up his hand and hit his wife, this husband has failed in life with the wife. Any person who raised up his hand and hit his wife, this person has failed. Because in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the system, you will, I mean, you hardly, you know, even shout at the wife. Although you're going to see things which you don't like, in the way she also sees things sometimes which she, she doesn't like, but the Prophet ﷺ gave us a nice uh, principle to use in this in this way. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يفرك مؤمن مؤمنة إن كره منها خلقا رضي منها خلقا آخر. I wish there is there is a time to come and talk about this uh, these topics because this needs a lecture by itself. Rasulullah ﷺ said, a person shouldn't hate his wife. Just because she did something wrong, the Prophet ﷺ said he shouldn't hate her. Because perhaps you might see something wrong from her, which she didn't like. For sure she has other things which are, which are good. Imagine this is how you're looking at your wife as somebody who is human being. Because sometimes we always want our wife to be like us. And that's what creates the problem in the house. You want your wife to think like you. And is it even good for your wife to think like you? By Allah, it's not. Because if your wife is thinking like you, most likely tragedy is going to take place in the, in the house. You are a bit rough and they are a bit calm, right? And this is for the benefit of who? The children in the house. Imagine you come to your house and you told your wife, where's the food? And she shouted at you. She said, am I your slave? Go to the kitchen and cook it by yourself. <laughs> what did you do after that? You are a man, right? Get her bo boxing. She is also a boxer. She also give you one. And the children will be watching you like ping pong, you know? At the end of the day, the food in the house will never be made. You know? But you come with your junoon sometimes. Somebody made you angry and you come to the house. Your wife see your face being very angry. You know, you started shouting. She keeps quiet. Yeah, that's good. That's why I said having these differences in terms of nature is always good for, for the marriage. But the moment the sister started taking from the Western community that she has to act like the man, trust me, that marriage might not last longer. Because naturally, they cannot be matched. Soon, he is going to divorce, and then she has to go and look for another advice what to do after, after this. So let's study Islam and study Tarbiyah and study the marital life from the Sunnah of the Prophet And trust me, my dear brothers and sisters, you're going to have a very... I mean, enjoyable life and marriage will be Jannah in this in this dunya. Get an idea? Inshallah, a time will come. We will come, inshallah, and enjoy this mentions of uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet concerning this matter. Thank you, Shaykh. The last question for the day. Shaykh, how can you deal with the shortcomings of your confidence with Allah's answers to our Sahara? You don't need to have this. That's why in many, many, uh, uh, many times somebody will tell you that you have to go and see a dream. Right? You have to see a dream, somebody coming to you to tell you what to do. No, istikhara is not like that. How do we do the istikhara? 
Okay, for instance, you want to engage in a business, but you're not sure whether it, it will lead you to success or not. You want to marry a person, but you're not sure whether it is a good uh, thing to do or not. What do you do first? You consult people that you trust first. You consult everyone. After you are done with the people, whether to go for it or to reject it, then the last thing you do is the istikhara. And my dear brothers and sisters, you have to be serious and you have to be sincere in your istikhara. It might be one of the reasons why our istikhara is not being I mean, successful because the heart is not really serious on that matter. You have to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as somebody who doesn't know and he's looking for the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him. And you go and do that istikhara and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose for you the best in the way the Prophet sallallahu mentioned. Can I do istikhara again? The scholar said, yes, you can do the istikhara again as long as the doubt still remain. So what are you going to follow after the istikhara? The scholar said, follow your satisfaction. Whatever you feel comfortable with, just go and do it. Azza wa Jalla, you will not liberate. it. Question, sometimes, sometimes you might do istikhara, right? And you marry. And then from the beginning of the marriage until the end where you divorce that person, you know, or she look for the divorce, you know, from the beginning of the marriage is none other than clashes and unrest. Does that mean you fail in your istikhara? No, not at all. Yeah, not at all. Because it might be this is a lesson that Allah SWT wants you to take, which you can never get it unless if you go through this, this system first. There is no failure at all. Whatever Allah SWT chose for you, Wallahi, there is a lesson. If you pay attention to it soon, you will come and say, Alhamdulillah, I have seen it my, myself. That's why those people who fail in the first marriage, if you see them when it comes to the second marriage, they're very sensitive and they're very particular. They're going to make sure that they make the right, the right choice. And they will tell you a lot you know, of practical approach concerning this matter because they have gone through the system. Although some people might say they fail, but there is no failure in it as long as they have given the trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose for them the best. And they did what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So there is no loss at all. It's a, it's a win-win uh, situation. You get it? So how do I know whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen or not? You don't need to know this. You just follow whatever you are satisfied with. Don't wait for a dream because you're not going to see a dream. You might see it and you might not see it, but it doesn't mean that whatever you see in the dream, this is what Allah SWT is choosing, is choosing for you. The Prophet Sallallahu never mentioned a dream to be a result or a time, uh, determining factor, you know, what you will use to see whether your istikhara is being accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or is rejected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So as I said, just do the istikhara and pay attention to what you are satisfied with and go on and do it and inshallah you will never regret inshallah. Barakallah. The event will be held on the 30th of the, the 30th of this month. You may find the registration link uh, in the link screen QR code at, at the end of the, uh, of the slides and sign up later, inshallah. We also have a feedback form. Can you go to the next slide? We also have the feedback form. Uh, this may take around only five minutes for you to fill it up. So by any means a lot of us, uh, you can check the link uh, for the form as well. Uh, we would also like to hear your opinion because we believe there's always uh, room for improvement and also what you like and what you feel like. Uh, the recruitment and the feedback forms are also there on the, on the, on the side of the website the the so you can scan from there as well. We would love to know what kind of topics you would like to uh, you'd like us uh, to, to bring in the upcoming events. So, uh, so for us to be confident that we can bring to you what you would like to learn. Um, regarding recruitment, if you're not part of Revivals and would like to join uh, Revivals and also be part of the team of volunteers who host such events, then you are most welcome. You can scan into our code again. Uh, you're just one scan away from leaving a legacy. 
all the things mentioned before can be accessed through the link tree. You can just kind of go again. Uh, finally, can we do the next slide? Yeah, we, we got the claim that the, that the QR code for the uh, for the pre-order of the hoodies were, was quite small too. So we made it quite big enough now. So I'm sure all of us can scan the QR code and pre-order the hoodies. We have now come to the end of the event, but before we close, I would like to invite uh, Abdurrahman to present a token of appreciation to our dear What do you mean? Okay. What is that? Okay. Is that clock? Okay. okay. Or even this one also. Okay. And also, can I? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I have one final message as usual. Whenever I give a talk, I leave uh, those who participate in this event with one uh, last message, which is uh, please preserve your identity. When a time similar to the time of uh, uh, the time in which the Prophet Sallallahu said, changing the religion is very easy. So be patient, my dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that wherever you are, you remember this title that you are a Muslim. Muslim means somebody who totally submits himself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you ever compromise any part of your life. It's all about a few days. Inshallah, we'll go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there you will enjoy, inshallah. So maximize your patience. Always remember that you're Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good and ease all of your affairs in this dunya. And the akhirah, inna hu bi kulli jameel and kafir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.